Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this first masterclass in the online masterclass series, Urbanizing Deltas of the World. My name is Jaap Evers, and I'm a senior lecturer in water and environmental policy at IHE Delft. Um, and I will be facilitating today's masterclass series. The speakers in our masterclass series all participated as PhD or postdoc research fellows in one of the research projects supported by the Urbanizing Deltas of the World program of the Netherlands Research Organization, NWO. And via this masterclass series, they will be presenting their work and insights to you. And you will have the opportunity to ask questions on the topic today. In every masterclass, we will have two main speakers. And let me take the opportunity to explain the setup of this masterclass. Something goes wrong. So there we are, that looks better. So first today we start with the presentation of Dr. Philip Minderhout, and that takes about 30 minutes. And as we are broadcasting on YouTube, you have the availability to write down your questions and comments in the comment box below the video. Please share your comments as soon as possible and do not wait until the end of the second speaker as there is a little bit of a delay of a minute or two between our recordings and the broadcasting to this live channel. And while Philip will give his presentation, me and my colleagues Leon Hermans and, uh, <coughs> and Shanur Hassan will collect your questions and we will merge and uh, put them forward to our speakers. After Philip's presentation, we continue with the second presentation of Seper Eslami. And again, his presentation will take about 30 minutes. Also then, please write down your questions and comments in the comment box. And maybe in order to prevent some confusion, please mention in the comment box when you have specifically a question to either Philip or Seper. When Seper has finished his presentation, we continue with a question and ask, answer session and Philip and Seper will give answers to those questions. If we do not have sufficient time to collect and give answers to all of your questions, we will answer them later also in the comment box directly to you. When it's about um, 10.55 local time, we will close this master class and we are going to thank you for your participation. I hope this is all clear. So let me now introduce you to our first speaker. Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Philip Minderhout. Dr. Philip Minderhout was a PhD researcher in the NWO UDW project Rise and Fall. And this project aimed to develop sustainable strategies for groundwater extraction and management and to understand and quant quantify uh, land subsidence and salt water inflow in the rapidly urbanized Mekong Delta in Vietnam. Philip is currently an assistant professor at the Wageningen University in the Netherlands and a Marie Curie research fellow at the University of Padova in Italy. He's also connected as an advisor to Deltares. He is specialized on uh, subsidence and relative sea level rise of coastal deltaic areas, connecting the fields of geology, hydrogeology, geotechnical engineering, and remote sensing. His research focuses on increasing the fundamental understanding of processes and drivers of deltaic subsidence and developing the numerical capacities to provide better spatial temporal assessments of current and projections of future deltaic subsidence. Is current active, he is currently active in research on coastal areas around the world, um, still in the Mekong, but also the Irrawaddy, the Po, the Mississippi Deltas, and Manila Bay, North Java coastline, and the Lagoon of Venice. Besides fundamental research, he focuses on impact-oriented research, aiming to create awareness and collaborative research uptake, and he's actively engaging with policymakers and NGOs to develop strategies to go with ongoing land subsidence and accelerated sea level rise. Let me now take the opportunity to thank you, Philip, for being with us here today and uh, to share your knowledge and insights that you have developed over the past years with our audience. That being said, I give the floor to you. 
Thanks a lot, Jaap, for this uh, very kind uh, and extensive introduction. And also thanks to you and, uh, and the others uh, of the organizing committee of this uh, Urbanizing Deltas of the World uh, Masterclass series. So um, I'm looking very, very much uh, forward to this, uh, to give this masterclass the number one together with, uh, with my colleague, uh, Seper. Okay, um, so hello to everyone um, and welcome to this, uh, this masterclass, Getting Grip on Sinking, Shrinking and Saltier Deltas. Um, this masterclass is derived from uh, the Rise and Fall project that we carried out um, starting from 2014. Uh, with a lot of different parties involved. Um, and you see some logos already here, and I'll come back to that um, in a while. So it's been it's been work by uh, a large group of people. Some of them are mentioned on this slide, um, and they also are uh, part of the publications that followed from this. So here, uh, a short, let's say, outline of this rise and fall program within the Urbanizing Deltas of the World uh, project. Uh, program. Um, it was a, 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 a project that consisted of Dutch partners led by uh, Utrecht University in the Netherlands, together with Deltaris, TNO, the Dutch Geological Survey, uh, and then several institutes uh, and Kanto University from Vietnam. So we really had uh, Vietnam and the Netherlands as a as a as entangled group of. Um, of researchers and institutes. Uh, here you see the, the prime suspects that worked on it. Um, so we had two guys from Vietnam, Hung and Chi. Then we had Saper working on the, the water dynamics uh, and myself working on land subsidence. And it, it's quite nice to see our, our young uh, pretty faces at the start of this project, which is already um, seven years ago now. So the outline of this masterclass is as followed. Uh, I will start talking uh, about uh, primarily land subsidies and deltas, and then Saper will take over, talk more about uh, dynamics of salt water intrusion, followed by this, this Q&A session afterwards. So I'd like to start with the following, um, to get everyone on the same page. So what is a delta and why do they matter? So a delta is a landform that forms when a river enters a body of water and it, it deposits sediments, uh, mud, uh, sand, clay, uh, to actually create new land, as you can see in this image on the right-hand side. And these deltas are very, very valuable to us. Uh, they are densely populated, more than 500 million people worldwide live in these places, and they have abundant resources. The land is very fertile. Uh, there's a lot of agriculture go uh, agricultural uh, practices going on. Uh, and hence, they're also very important for uh, global food production uh, and food security. So these deltas are places that play uh, a very important role in actually humans living on planet Earth. Well, these deltas have seen a lot of changes in the past uh, centuries and, uh, and decades. And here uh, I'm going to show you how these changes, uh, some of these changes. So here we see a natural uh, cross-section of, of a delta before actually humans uh, intervened in these landscapes. And then when we started to occupy these places, we started to change the land. So um, create land use changes, start uh, agricultural practices. We started to settle in larger settlements and build cities. And we started to use the natural resources, such as, for example, groundwater. Also in the upstream domain, uh, we started to um, develop a lot of infrastructural uh, um, uh, infrastructures, for example, uh, like dams for hydro, hydropower production. Uh, and these dams, they block the flow of sediment and water to these deltas. And we take uh, sand, for example, from the, uh, from the channels of the river. Well, as you all know, we are now living in, a, in an age with um, acceleration of, of climate change, and that is causing a lot of uh, stresses and changes in environments all around the world. So as a result, we see an increase in the amount of floodings happening in these deltas. There's more and more uh, saline intrusion in the, in the surface channels. We see more coastal floodings occurring uh, and events um, like gradual coastal erosion happening um, all over the world in, in these places. 
also linked to the fact that we built these upstream dams blocking additional sediments to the coastlines. Also in the groundwater, uh, salt water is intruding. Um, and if we over extract, for example, groundwater, there's more and more salt water replacing the, the fresh water that was there before. And as you all know, uh, the sea levels rise because of global warming. And depending on where you are on the globe, this ranges from three to 10 millimeters per year. But these deltas themselves are not stable. They also e experience land subsidence. So they can sink uh, and they can actually lose elevation. And these rates can be quite high, as you will see in this, uh, this presentation. Well, together, these two effects, the land going down and the sea going up, is actually what we call relative sea level rise. And this is what you experience when you are standing at the coastline and you just watch the water levels uh, going up. So it is really the relative sea level rise that matters if you talk about, um, about these coastal places. So let's go to some of the major deltas on the world. Um, so we see here some large systems, the Amazon, uh, Genghis Brahmaputra, for example, the yellow, right here is the Mekong. And in colors, um, you can see elevation. And the warmer the color, so the more red, it means the lower the elevation of these deltas. So as you can see, a lot of these deltas, they are in this, this red zone meaning they're very low, elevated above local sea level. Well, this makes them very sensitive to changes. For example, like climate change or changes by humans. And this elevation is key because a low elevation to sea means that small changes can have already large impacts. And actually, the sinking of these deltas is something that is happening all around the world. Here are some studies from different deltas around the world that, uh, that show measurements from space and the rate at which these deltas are currently sinking. And you can see some of the rates, they go up very high to several even decimeters per year. So this is one or two magnitudes larger than uh, sea levels are rising. And a recent study showed the following. So today, the majority of the global relative sea level rise 50 to 70 percent experienced by humans is caused by land subsidence uh, rather than the global warming induced sea level rise. So they, they looked at where are people actually living along the coastline and what is causing the relative sea level rise. Uh, and they found that on a global scale, land subsidence at the moment is uh, more impactful than sea level rise. So what is causing land subsidence in these, uh, in, in, in these deltas? So here we have a cross section of a delta uh, and a subsurface of sediments lying on top of, uh, of, of bedrock. Well, first of all, land subsidence is a natural process. Um, these sediments that are deposited by a river, they are soft and they can compress over time. Uh, and also when new sediment is added on top of them. So this is what we call loading. So, the natural loading effect of, of, of uh, other sediments, biomass, but also uh, water during floods is causing uh, pressure on the, on the sediments in the subsurface and causes them to compact. Then there's also uh, the component which is caused by, uh, let's say, deeper rooted effects like tectonics uh, and other um, earth crust dynamics. So land subsidence can be accelerated by human activities. As you can imagine, the, the loading factor can be enhanced when we as humans uh, build infrastructure on top of these deltas, such as roads or, or buildings, and they cause additional pressure on these soft sediments and cause uh, compaction. But also um, when, let's say, uh, uh, when, when water is drained from these delta surfaces, uh, actually, the water creates some sort of a, um, a buoyancy effect. So it keeps, it's, it's actually lifting up the sediment. So when you drain the water, there's actually a loading effect happening uh, in, the, in the shallow subsurface. And this is, for example, a main factor uh, in the Netherlands, which is causing a lot of compaction, but also uh, oxidation if you have organics in the, uh, in the shallow subsurface. 
And then there's the extraction of, uh, of fluids from the subsurface. This can be water, this can be hydrocarbons, oil, gas. Uh, and as you can imagine, when you remove these types of, uh, of resources from the subsurface, the pressure is dropping and that causes uh, land subsidence. So in general, we see that land subsidence uh, ranging from, um, uh, from human induced processes tends to be much larger and faster than the, the natural induced uh, processes. And also it can be very hi highly uh, very variable in time and space. So depending on where you are in the delta, um, other factors are more important in driving uh, land subsidence. So let's uh, let's go to the Mekong Delta where we uh, where we did our research. Um, it is the third largest delta in the world, and it's uh, created by the the river the Mekong that flows all the way from the Himalayas through Southeast Asia and then enters in the sea in the south of Vietnam. It is uh, very densely populated, uh, 18 million people in the delta and almost 9 million people in Ho Chi Minh City, which is in an adjacent delta, very close to, uh, to the Mekong Delta. And it experienced rapid development uh, and it's dealing with all the challenges that we see in these modern urbanizing deltas. So when we started in 2014, what was already known in terms of land subsidence? Well, recently, just a couple of months before uh, we started, this study came out by Stanford University uh, and they showed by satellite measurements um, the, 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 the estimate of how much land subsidence was occurring in this delta. And this was actually the first time that land subsidence was mapped or was being written about uh, on this delta. Prior to that, there was no reports on any land subsidence. So this study showed that something was uh, was going on and rates in the delta are sometimes in places going to two to three centimeters per year. And then Ho Chi Minh City as an, uh, as an extremity with, uh, with higher rates even. And also when you're in the delta itself, you can see uh, the evidence of land subsidence. For example, when you uh, drive around and you look at the bridges, you often see these kind of cracks or you see these kind of uh, let's say newly constructed ramps in order to be able to drive onto these bridges because the bridge is founded at a deeper level and the road that leads to the bridge is unfounded so there's a differential compaction going on so this these are signs that there's shallow substance going on and then when you find a groundwater wells that can be going down to to 200 300 400 meters and actually uh, are in that way fixed at that depth uh, they can show you a signal that substance may also happen at a much deeper level. So you can see these groundwater wells sticking out of, of the land. For example, here, this used to be the original surface when, when they created this one. And now the present surface is much lower. So clearly there's subsidence happening in the Mekong Delta. But the question is, what is exactly causing it? And also, what does it uh, hold for the future? So that's what we started to study uh, in the end of 2014. And I'm going to take you through the journey that we made, um, and I'm going to highlight three things that we uh, that we actually discovered things on with our research. So the first was uh, how much natural loading, natural compaction is actually happening in this delta. So what is the natural component? Then we looked into what is the, um, the impact of humans on land subsidence, and we zoomed into the effect of the extraction of groundwater, because we know that can be uh, a very notorious factor for high rates of land subsidence. So let's go to the evolution of the Mekong Delta in the Holocene. It is very important to realize that landforms like deltas are actually very young landforms. Um, they only they were only created um, between seven and 6,000 years ago. Uh, and this is because before that, the sea level was much lower than it is today. Um, so when we go back 7,000 years ago, the coastline would be somewhere about present day Cambodia. So when the Egyptians were building pyramids, the Mekong Delta, as we see it on the map right here, was actually not there yet. It was just an open sea. And since that time, uh, this, this new delta was formed by 
a massive amount of sediments brought down uh, by the Mekong Delta, creating this new uh, and very flat landform. So there's a very rapid, what we call transgression, so growth of land that happened during the late Holocene in, in the last thousands of years. Uh, and all these deposits that are deposited in, uh, in a shallow sea, which was about 20 meters deep, um, are very, let's say, new and young deposits. So it means they can actually compact quite a lot. So there are several, some, some sparse measurements available uh, that actually measure really high rates of compaction in these, these top 20 meters. So some places even go up to five centimeters, uh, which is really a lot when you talk about natural compaction. Uh, and actually with um, modeling together with the University of Padua, we were able to confirm that it's actually possible if you have such a young delta that that progressed into the sea at such a high speed as the Mekong, you can actually create these, these unprecedentedly high compaction rates uh, as a natural signal from this, this rapid delta evolution. And this is quite uh, important to know because this factor, this natural compaction factor, is not something you can stop. So the only way is uh, adaptation. So you have to bring in new sediments in order to compensate for the continuous uh, elevation loss, which is also the natural mechanism uh, that these deltas uh, in a normal situation would sustain uh, their coastlines. And we try to make a first estimate of natural compaction. We see that here. And you can see that especially along the coastlines, there is this high signal of, uh, of natural compaction occurring. So then we started to look at what can we what can we see in terms of um, human impact and human uh, control uh, driving land substance? So we compared this section of the Stanford measured um, rates from satellite with a series of land use maps that we created. And we analyzed, um, we an analyzed correlations between these. So when we put them together, we found the following relation. So these are different land use classes up here, and these are the average uh, rates of land substance experienced by these different land use classes. And here are the drivers of land subsidence. So the more pluses you see, the stronger these drivers are um, related to these types of land use. And I'll walk you through it. So from left to right, we see an increase of human drivers with an increase of land substance rates. But these two classes, marshland and wetland forest, are the natural classes. So they experience the lowest subsidence rates. Then we have agricultural classes, which have a diverse range of the amount of land subsidence they experience. And we see the highest rates occurring in urban, urban environments, where we also expect most impact by human activities. Well, you see this outlier, let's say that the weird duck in the pond, it's, uh, it's the mangrove forests. Uh, but we can actually explain that. So this is a natural land use class, but they are situated along the coastline. And as you remember from the previous slides, this is the place where we have very high natural compaction. So that's actually what's uh, explaining this, uh, this relation here. So we see higher subsidence rates with more human activities. Okay, then we focused, uh, we decided to zoom in more on uh, the extraction of groundwater. So let's have a look at what's happening in the Mekong Delta. It is a very fertile uh, delta and it creates uh, a lot of rice, making Vietnam the second uh, most, the second largest exporter of rice in the world. We also see vegetables, for example, these onion farms, more of the on the elevated ridges towards the coastline. There's uh, fruit farming going on, especially in islands uh, close to the river channels. In the upstream domain, in the freshwater domain, there's a lot of fish farms uh, situated. And there's an increasing amount of shrimp farms in the, in the coastal zone, also as a result of increased uh, salinization. There's a conversion towards uh, shrimp farming. And on top of that, the development in the delta uh, also increased the amount of water used by industries and, uh, and, and domestic use. So let's have a look at the groundwater use uh, as we know it from the data in the delta. So at the start of the, uh, of the, in the 90s, there was not so much extraction going on. 
but then there was this really massive increase since uh, since this new millennium uh, and we see this really steep uh, uh, increase of extraction well this water is coming from uh, the subsurface in the Mekong Delta and it can be in places up to more than 500 uh, meter thick so this is 500 meter of unconsolidated sediments that contains water and what we see from the measurements if uh, we look at the measurements that are situated in the different layers in the subsurface we see a very interesting pattern so we have measurements here from 1995 uh, and the stop one that you see here is actually the one that's connected with the surface water so we see a seasonal trend of wet and dry season every year but we don't really see a gradual decline over time and this is because the uh, the surface of the delta uh, is still experiencing flooding so there's a lot of recharge in this top aquifer that is openly connected but then when we go to the aquifers that are located more in the subsurface and are actually closed off by clay layers from this top system, we see this uh, gradual and, and steady consistent decrease in water pressure actually at other depths. So this goes up to 400 meters in depth in this, uh, in this place. So we can see this disconnect between the, the, the surface system that is wet and that, uh, that has a lot of water and the decrease of in pressure in this subsurface here. Well, and we know this can cause uh, this can cause compaction in this thick pack of unconsolidated sediments. So how is this working? Well, it goes as follows. So the water is extracted uh, from the sand layers that are in the, in the subsurface. So this is sand and gravel. But in between the sand and gravel, there's also layers of clays and silts, uh, small particles. And when we look at in, into the, the skeleton of these, uh, these sediments, it looks like this. So it's, it's a sort of plates, and there's quite a lot of, uh, of space between them uh, in which there's water. Well, what happens when you extract water uh, and water is being pushed out of these, uh, between these, these clays? Um, so in a way, these clay particles, they behave the same as dirty plates in a sink. So this, is, this would be the natural sedimentation of of, of dishes in a sink. There's a lot of pore space. There's a lot of room for, for in this case, air, but in, in, in also water in the subsurface. Uh, and then when you do the dishes, actually you remove a lot of this space and the same amount of dishes actually fit. They reorientate and they fit in a much smaller volume. And this is the same process that happens in the subsurface when uh, water pressure is dropping and uh, water is actually being pushed out of these clays and silts. So we see this realignment of these particles and the thinning of these layers. And that results in a gradual lowering of the land surface. And I'd like to show you now a, a video abstract to, uh, to give you some more insights on the work that we did on groundwater extraction. I hope Laura can uh, can help in putting on this movie. I heard something. Um. I'm not seeing the movie appearing. I have to do it. I cannot press play. Okay, I cannot see the uh, the video. Sorry for that. Here we go. The Mekong Delta is one of the largest deltas in the world, and it is inhabited by uh, about 20 million people and it's producing food for almost 200 million people. The Mekong Delta is uh, subsiding, but the amount of subsidence and the exact causes of subsidence are still unknown. What we see is that there is a very high increase in groundwater use, and we know that excessive groundwater use can cause land subsidence. The question is how much land subsidence 
is actually caused by the increase of groundwater use over the past 25 years. We build a, a large 3D hydrogeological model of the Mekong Delta in which we can simulate the groundwater use and extraction of the past 25 years. And we use that simulation to calculate the amount of land subsidence caused by this groundwater extraction. On the left side we see um, the hydraulic head of one of the aquifers in the, in the model and on the right side we see cumulative subsidence uh, as a result of ongoing uh, groundwater extraction. And then when we go through the model we see that there's a gradual increase in hydraulic head drop and then we see uh, an increase of the cumulative subsidence. This is a nice example of what happens when you are uh, extracting groundwater. So this used to be the old surface when the well was, uh, was built here. And now we see that the surface level is at least 30 centimeters lower. At the start of the modeling period, the hydrogeological situation of the delta was actually in a rather undisturbed state. And if you talk about land subsidence caused by groundwater extraction, there wasn't hardly any of that um, 20, 25 years ago. With the high subsidence rates that we see at present, the delta will get more vulnerable to flooding uh, and there will be salinization in the surface water and in the groundwater. And this is putting pressure on the agricultural system in the delta, but also, of course, on the, on the livelihood of the people living there. Okay, I'll stop it, uh, I'll stop it right here. We can go back to the, uh, to the PowerPoint. Great. So what you see, what you saw in this uh, in this this video was actually in, in the video abstract that was um, with the modeling that we created. So we, we created this uh, this three D model, uh, as as is seen here, from a lot of measurements in there and calibration. And when we run it, we see this consistent drop in water pressure almost throughout this entire uh, aquifer system. And here we see again this simulation from the movie. So on the left side. This is water pressure going down, and this is cumulative subsidence. So how much land subsidence this would uh, cause. And what we saw and what we found was really this acceleration of land subsidence following this, uh, this increasing trend of groundwater extraction. Uh, and the rates that we found were that actually extraction induced subsidence is uh, up to a magnitude higher than, than um, absolute sea level rise for this delta. Uh, and interestingly, this was later confirmed also by more recent uh, estimates of, of land substance uh, by satellites. So here we have the Stanford study, 2006-2010, <clears throat> about two to three centimeters in places in the delta. Um, but this newer uh, INSAR study that looks to a much, let's say, 10 years later, recent period, uh, we see rates that go up five to six centimeters in quite some places in the delta. So this acceleration that we first modeled, we now also see in measurements. Uh, and we also see that the groundwater uh, overexploitation almost, almost uh, impacts the entire delta. So it's really a widespread issue. So how can we use this model that we built actually to look into the future? Well, what we did is we created several different pathways of potential extractions for the future. So we have what we call non-mitigation scenarios in which groundwater extraction continues to grow into the future and then mitigation scenarios in which different degrees of uh, reduction of groundwater extraction so this is what you could do if you would put policy on the extraction of groundwater well we put that into the model and we could calculate the effects towards the end of the century so with the higher extractions there's more and more depletion while with, if we reduce extractions there's actually um, an increase again in the water levels. Um, when we look to land substance rates, of course, with higher depletions, we see massive amounts of land substance in the future. Uh, but interestingly, also, when we go to the scenario in which we completely stop groundwater extraction, uh, there is still land substance happening. And this is because it's a delayed process of the dewatering of these clays. So it's an important realization to know that even if you stop today with extraction, the process that is already, uh, let's say, in place will still continue towards the future, but at a much lower rate than if you continue extracting. 
So then how do we know how much impact this has uh, on the land? Well, for that, you need to know the elevation of the delta. Uh, and I'm going to quickly skip these slides. These are, these are let's say, old elevation maps from satellite that were used. Um, and they, they gave, they were used in a lot of reports, but they gave quite a, a wrong impression of the delta, as we can see here. So the average elevation from the widely used SATM dam, as it was used in these studies, was um, about two and a half meters above sea level. Um, but it looked really weird with all these striping. So we created our own elevation map using uh, local points uh, from, from Vietnamese data. And we actually arrived to an elevation that was much that was even lower than uh, one meter above sea level on average. Well, there's several two technical reasons for that. Uh, I will skip that in detail. But what's most important to, to realize here is that the previous studies uh, on the impact of sea level rise actually um, were using an elevation that was almost one and a half meters higher, uh, almost two meters higher than the actual situation. Um, so this is more than or let's say a century of sea level rise. Um, well, as you can imagine, this caused a lot of impact in uh, in, in the media uh, because people realized that this is quite a quite a big thing. Um, and also, for example, the the, the Mekong River Committee uh, they released uh, a, uh, let's say they, they they commented on this and they said if the findings by Utrecht University are accurate, then the scientific community and government agencies need to, cons to update all their modeling works. And also the adaptation strategy and action plan needs to be carried out faster than we had planned. So it really shows that people were, um, let's say, motivated by this uh, and, and that they realized that something uh, had to be done. So if we combine this elevation together with these extraction pathways, we arrive to the following. Um, so what happens if we would strongly reduce the amount of groundwater extraction. So we take the M3 scenarios. So we only allow 25% of the current extractions. Then this would be the projection of the future elevation. And in blue is the area of the land that is uh, currently at or below sea level uh, at these, th these moments in time. It doesn't mean flooded because it can be protected uh, by dike systems, but it means below sea level. Uh, and that create that really increases the cost of living. We look to the uh, M1 scenario, we see that quite a bit more of the delta is below sea level. And if we look to the moderate business as usual, gradual increase of groundwater extraction, by the end of the century, uh, large parts of this delta will be uh, situated below sea level. So there's a clear message here that the extraction of groundwater is not a free resource because you actually pay with it uh, by elevation and elevation loss and also uh, salinization, as Sapir will tell you about in the second part. I'll skip this one, and maybe it comes back in the discussion. Quickly, can river sedimentation compensate elevation loss? Only for a small part, if you look to the massive, uh, massive rates. Uh, I'll go with that. So how to move forward in the Mekong Delta? Uh, well, at the moment, there's still not a measuring system of land subsidence. So the advice is to really install this system to make observations in situ of land subsidence. Mitigation is very important. So the reduction of groundwater extraction, that's a, that's a big thing. Do not extract more than is recharged. But there's also other options to do. So water saving techniques or circular water management solutions. Uh, and for all this land substance that cannot be avoided, such as the natural compaction, um, really reallowing natural sedimentation onto the delta plain is the only way to actually compensate the elevation loss. And it's important also to realize that trying to protect the entire delta with a dike system will be impossible. Um, so it is, it is, uh, it will create an irreversible situation. But also, if you look purely to the size of this delta, it's not a feasible, uh, a feasible option. So some conclusions I will quickly lay out and then we go to Sapir. Um, so substance is caused by natural processes, but the majority by human uh, activities, such as the extraction of groundwater. We see an acceleration of this land substance towards the present. 
the delta is much lower elevated than previously thought. And there, if groundwater extraction is not restricted, it could drown large parts of the delta already within decades. So what we see is that only adaptation is no longer a viable strategy. So mitigation strategies to slow down subsidence are urgently needed, and especially focused on uh, the extraction of groundwater. But we also see that the time or elevation to mitigate is uh, rapidly running out. And I'll just give you this as the last one. It's uh, land substance is really a 4D problem. There's a strong link with anthropogenic land use. Uh, and we see that human induced rates are much higher than um, men than natural rates. I'll skip this. I thank you for your attention. And we now go to, uh, to part two with uh, Sepan. Philip, thank you, Philip, for this uh, very interesting presentation. I have uh, absolutely learned a lot more about uh, soil subsidence in the Mekong Delta than uh, I knew before. So thank you for that. Um, very inspiring. I also saw that there are quite some interesting um, comments either in our live Facebook um, uh, broadcasting and on our YouTube comments box, but please um, participants continue to uh, submit your questions. If you have some, do not uh, wait with it because otherwise you might forget about it. And that's uh, what we wouldn't like. So thank you, Philip, for your very interesting presentation. And then we move on to our second speaker of today, who is uh, Dr. Seper Eslami. A, um, a colleague of uh, Philip in the NWO uh, Urbanizing Deltas of the World project Rise and Fall, in which he was also a PhD researcher. Um, and of course, for the participants, if you have interest uh, in the outcomes and uh, the, the, the scientific outputs and the articles that has been produced in this project, please visit also um, their website. If you go to your favorite search engine, and you uh, would type uh, rise and fall urbanizing delts of the world project and wo you'll definitely find it so let's continue to our second speaker um Seper is a, a fluvial coastal scientist and he's specialized in linking environmental change in deltas to climatic and anthropogenic drivers. And during his PhD research at the Utrecht University, he's been studying the issue of salt intrusion in the Mekong Delta and disentangling the drivers of exposure and vulnerability. Seber is um, currently a senior advisor at Deltaris, and he's currently based in Singapore, and he's also joining us from Singapore. Um, and in this capacity, he's focused mainly on climate change adaptation studies and climate policy development in Singapore, as well as that he's actively working on developing mitigation and adaptation strategies for the Asian deltas. Um, his presentation will be about the dynamics of salt intrusion in the Mekong Delta. And with this having been said, Saper, thank you for being with us today and to share your knowledge uh, with our audience and the floor is yours. Pleasure to be here, Jaap. Thanks for the introduction. And um, I would say uh, <coughs> uh, good morning, afternoon, and maybe evening. I see that there are uh, participants from around the world. Um, so I'm presenting this uh, work that has been mainly done under uh, the umbrella of urbanizing deltas of the world uh, and within the rise and fall project that Philip gave a uh, good introduction uh, about that. Um, uh, I'm presenting the work, but there has been significant contribution from uh, a large number of people uh, affiliated with different institutes throughout uh, the six years, more or less lifetime of the project. Um, so I would uh, I mentioned them, uh, um, and 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 it's important to, that that uh, this to know that this work wouldn't be possible without their contributions. Um, I briefly touch upon the Mekong River Basin in this talk. Uh, talk about salinity and tides in the Mekong Delta, um, and.
and uh, discuss the historical trends and uh, uh, and and talk about uh, the outlook um, towards the end of the century and what we can expect for the Mekong Delta uh, and close this uh, presentation with some conclusions and lessons learned through the Rise and Fall project. Uh, Mekong River Basin in Southeast Asia. Um, <coughs> it uh, runs uh, through uh, six countries, uh, China, Laos, uh, Thailand, Myanmar, uh, Cambodia, and Vietnam. It carries half a trillion cubic meter of water per year, more or less, and um, plus minus 100 uh, million tons of sediment every year. Um, it's uh, subject to uh, extreme seasonality driven by the monsoon. Uh, for instance, in this picture, we see the north uh, western monsoon uh, with predominantly, uh, uh, no, sorry, northeastern monsoon with predominantly uh, easterly wind. Uh, here is the Mekong Delta. This is the Southeast Asia map. Here you see India. Uh, here is the Vietnam Mekong Delta. Um, and this uh, changes uh, in 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 uh, the northern hemisphere summer uh, to the southwestern monsoon with predominantly uh, uh, westerly wave uh, wind. Um, the um, northeastern monsoon coincides with uh, brings about the dry season of the Mekong Delta when the river discharges down to uh, two, three, four, two, three thousand cubic meter per second. Uh, and the southwestern monsoon brings the wet season, which uh, can uh, river uh, river discharge can reach uh, forty thousand cubic meter per second. So there's a huge difference. Apart from that, uh, the delta is existential to the lives of millions of people across uh, Southeast Asia, uh, and that. Uh, uh, has resulted also significant anthropogenic uh, impact on the delta. As we see, for instance, there are already 13 completed hydropower dams along the main uh, stream of the Mekong River, and there are uh, something north of 300 operational hydropower and irrigation dams uh, along the tributaries of the delta. Um, Sand resources of the delta are very much wanted in the region for um, development and construction, and that has resulted in significant sand mining uh, uh, volumes across uh, the river basin along the Mekong River. Um, and if you look at the Mekong Delta at the end of uh, this uh, Mekong River basin, it's uh, sometimes referred to as the uh, rice bowl of Southeast Asia uh, because of intense uh, agriculture and aquaculture that is uh, going on in this um, um, uh, uh, delta. It provides 50% of the national food and um, it's uh, home to more than 22 million people. Um, uh, it's no fun without some pictures. Uh, Philip gave an impression of the Delta. Here I have uh, a little bit more uh, on, for instance, the, 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 uh, the rice plantations uh, in the Delta. Uh, the Delta has thousands of canals uh, over the entire uh, system uh, called navigation and irrigation canals. So these canals are used for navigation uh, um, and, and, and transfer of goods as well as uh, extraction of water for uh, agricultural and aquacultural purposes. And this is an image of uh, uh, sand mining in the Mekong River. So if you uh, fly over the Mekong Delta or if you sit by the river, uh, it's inevitable that you would uh, notice a large number of ships that are uh, barges that are moving uh, some sort of uh, construction material. Uh, so, um, with that in mind, uh, this shows a little bit the, 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 the magnitude of the system. So, this is uh, an aerial picture of one of the uh, one of the distributary channels in the estuarian system of the Mekong Delta, main main channels. Uh, you see a small barge, actually a big barge that uh, we're talking about two three kilometer uh, width of these uh, these uh, channels, uh, estuarian channels. Um, if we look at the historical event, so this project uh, of Rise and Fall started in 2015, and already in 2016 we faced reality with a huge drought event uh, in the Mekong Delta. The UN Situation Report in 2016 uh, reported 
during the event in in the order of 250 million uh, dollar loss of uh, agricultural products. In 2015, at the same time, uh, there were um, publications uh, showing the effect of sea level rise and climate change uh, on the Mekong Delta projecting salt intrusion uh, for the year 2050. That's in the year 2015. Um, but in 2016, this drought event actually exceeded the projections of the year 2015. So that triggered a lot of uh, questions for us. So where, where, where did suddenly that come from? Uh, how did uh, science uh, go so wrong uh, at, 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 at it within one year? Um, so um, uh, uh, at the inception of the project, once we uh, were expecting the drought event, we went to the Delta for measurements of the uh, extreme event. Uh, uh, this is our uh, little, uh, <coughs> uh, let's say, workshop uh, in one of the villages in the Mekong Delta, in a, in a parking lot of a motel room. This was our boat where we were going around with a fishing boat that we were doing measurements uh, across the river. Uh, and of course, uh, mangroves and palm trees are uh, everywhere uh, in the Mekong Delta. Um, <clears throat> it didn't take so long that in 2020, again, another uh, historical uh, drought and salinity intrusion event happened that actually even uh, surpassed by some measures surpassed the 2016 event. So um, it's uh, like, for instance, if you see this picture, uh, one of these uh, navigation irrigation canals that I showed the picture is is, is fully dry. So the, the drought uh, 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 was significant, and its resulting salt intrusion has been uh, devastating to the event. Um, that um, resulted, uh, uh, that, that, that was basically motivating a, a dive into the historical trends uh, in the Delta and to understand what is actually happening. Because salt intrusion in the Mekong Delta is key to land use, basically the fact that what you can plant in these agricultural fields driven by do you have access to fresh water or not. Uh, that's why it's one of the main motivators of land use in the Mekong Delta. And there were more and more reports of increased salt intrusion in Delta. Not only the extreme events, but also uh, complaints and complaints in the areas uh, where, uh, the, uh, they, where they did not expect, uh, 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 they did not have faced uh, 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 salt intrusion in, in, in historically. Uh, so what is salt intrusion? If we uh, cross a, uh, an estuary and look at uh, the river, uh, the estuary, but this is more or less where the delta is located, and the ocean, uh, we see that um, this uh, uh, salinity is uh, uh, a maximum at the ocean, uh, at the estuary mouth, and then it decreases upstream towards the river, uh, and it's basically the competition between ocean forces uh, being mainly tides, and water level, and, and, and wind, for instance, and river forces, which is basically just discharge that is pushing salt back. And all these two are competing in a geometry and bathymetry, which is the uh, the geological condition that the estuary is located in. So any of these three uh, that uh, starts changing you can expect that this salt balance between fresh and saline water uh, is, uh, is going to change. So um, to make it a little bit more uh, vivid on the journey we uh, had uh, the last couple of years, at that time, 2019, there was a BBC documentary that mentioned climate change, Vietnam destroying family life. I put it here and I come back to this uh, uh, in a few slides. So let's look at what happened historically in the in the delta in terms of salt intrusion. So if we look at, for instance, this station, um, if we just look at the red uh, lines, it's showing the higher five percent salinity measurements, stationary salinity measurements from the year 1997 to 2018. And if I associate one number per season, uh, uh, like the top five percent, I do see an increasing trend uh, over the past uh, 20 years. So there is definitely a trend, no question about that. Uh, where is that? Where well, we mentioned ocean forces and river forces against each other in a, in a given uh, bathymetry and geometry. So if you look at the freshwater inflow to the delta, um, <coughs> 
Uh, this is um, uh, Cartier, so we're talking about something about 500 kilometers from the sea upstream in Cambodia, where we have the total dry season discharge in black and the minimum dry season discharge in gray from 1986 to 2018. And we also see that there is an increasing trend of freshwater over the last uh, 35 years. And this is curious because that means that with by despite increasing freshwater discharge, we have increasing salt intrusion. So it's a bit counterintuitive. So that's not going to answer our questions. What about ocean forces? If we look at um, ocean uh, sea levels, uh, even without studying too much, we do see an increasing trend in the water level, so this is a tidal signal at uh, this station, at one of the, uh, at the mouth of one of the estuaries. And what we see is that, and if we, from the water level variation, if we extract the tidal uh, amplitude, um, then we see that the tidal amplitude also follows a slightly increasing trend at the estuary mouth. So there's a question mark whether this is a relevant trend. Um, but if you look at the tidal signal within the delta, so at this station, uh, let's, this is 80 kilometers uh, from the sea, 80 kilometers inland, you see that there's a still a strong tidal signal, very strong tidal signal in the delta. In fact, the flow is going back and forth all the time <coughs> in the delta. If we look at that, even without calculation, we do see an increasing trend of uh, um, uh, 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 tidal difference. And if you look at the tidal amplitudes, we see a huge variation in tidal amplitude. In fact, if you look at the actual trends until, uh, let's say, 2006 7, uh, the, it more or less followed the same trend as the, uh, as the sea. Um, but from this time on, uh, the, the trend has been significantly increasing and almost. Uh, and total deviating from the sea level rise trend, or the trend that can be associated to sea level rise. So this definitely can explain a lot, and then we have to dig deeper into it. So if I go back to this documentary, uh, BBC documentary, at, at, at some point it mentions about seven or eight years ago, the weather changed drastically. This is a family that had to relocate from the villages of the Mekong Delta to Ho Chi Minh City to find a job because they lost their land to erosion. And uh, they talk about seven or eight years ago that the weather changed drastically and, and associate that to climate change. In fact, if we go back seven, eight years back to when they talk about, they actually arrive at exact location when the tidal signal started deviating from, uh, from the sea level rise trend. So we suddenly see this increase in, uh, in tidal range that in our opinion is key to understanding what drives salt intrusion and higher water levels and uh, city flooding and river bed and bank erosion. So if we look further a little bit uh, into data and uh, look at uh, the measurements, um, <clears throat> if you have a little bit of a background in coastal engineering, uh, you might understand this and if not, take it from me and then uh, we can discuss this later. So for instance, we look at all these measurement stations in the Mekong Delta. They are all water level measurement stations. What we do is that we calculate how long it takes for the tide to travel from one station to the next station. So from here to here or from this station to this station. So the, the distance it takes for the tide to travel to uh, in between these stations. And if, um, I take this one, for instance, um, uh, here we see the year on the x-axis from 2000 to 2015, actually it starts before, but 2000 to 2015, and this is minutes on the y-axis showing that it used to take something in the order of 200 minutes for the tide to travel from this station to this station, but that number started dropping from the year 2004-05 down onwards. And we see that this, uh, this, this downward trend, so reducing the time that the tide travels between two stations, which basically means the time is traveling faster, it's actually happening in all uh, Asturian channels. And if with a bit of a coastal engineering background that you know that the tidal travel speed is very simple, is square root of uh, gravitational acceleration type steps. So uh, with depth uh, increasing, uh, tidal travel speed increase. That 
without measuring any river bed level in time, we could conclude that uh, uh, on average, the river bed levels have been two to three meter uh, deeper. And this was validated further in 2000, actually already this year. Uh, so without measurements uh, of uh, direct measurement of river beds, uh, we could actually conclude that at that time from the tidal dynamics. And uh, at that time, there was already some measurements, like for instance, cross-section measurements, and we also published it with our colleagues in Tokyo University. Uh, the, between 2014 and 2017, there was a huge, significant drop in river bed levels uh, at multiple cross-sections. So this is not the entire bathymetry of all the delta, all the estuarian system, but uh, <clears throat> some cross-sections. And we could already see, for instance, in this one, massive drop in depth uh, of about 10 meters. And uh, uh, note that uh, these specific cross sections were uh, known to be close to sand mines. So we did expect larger, uh, larger than two, three meter uh, difference in these stations. <coughs> uh, but the average, it's uh, something in that order of two, three meters. Um, so that brought us to this uh, question, what is the sediment budget of the delta? So the, the, the pristine system used to carry 660 million tons per year. Uh, more recent uh, estimates uh, were 20 to 80 million tons per year. And uh, with all these dams, uh, the expected efficiency of sediment trapping by all these dams, it's actually up to 95%. So expected that in the order of 95% of sediment can be <coughs> stuck behind the dams. And we have a sand mining of 30 to 50 million ton per year uh, in the delta itself, um, which, which is the estimate we made ourselves based on all the uh, sand mining licenses, which was four times before, four times more than the previous estimates. Uh, and we mapped those sand mining, uh, <coughs> that, that uh, sand mining uh, estimates um, uh, all over, and this is all legal estimates. So you can also expect some illegal uh, sand mining uh, in the delta. That basically means that the sediment budget of the delta is below zero. So from that, we could continue, we could uh, immediately con uh, conclude that climate change is real. That's not no question about that. But what we face in the Mekong is environmental change, and that. If we look at uh, increased salt intrusion as, as, as an indicator of that, it's, uh, of course, sea level rise of three millimeter per year does have some contribution there. Uh, <clears throat> but we, uh, uh, Philip just explained that the land substance is an order of magnitude larger than that, which is mainly driven by anthropogenic processes. But also we have uh, sediment trapping by upstream dams and excessive sand mining that results in river bed and bank erosion. And that also results in increased tidal range of 20 millimeter per year over the last two decades, 15, 15 years more or less. And <laughs> two to three meter or 10 to 15 centimeter of river bed level erosion that also contribute to uh, salt intrusion in the delta. And, the, the, and this, element is nearly five to ten percent of the total salt intrusion increase that we've seen in the delta and 90 percent more than 90 percent of that is uh, driven by upstream processes and within and processes within the delta so salt intrusion higher tides city blood uh, city flooding bank erosion can all be associated to um, <coughs> uh, sediment starvation and especially uh, uh, um, in, in uh, sand, which can be sand mining, it's driven by sand mining and uh, sediment uh, trapping. Uh, here, I would like to show you a little uh, movie of um, um, uh, that. Let me uh, that we as an, as an uh, <coughs> um, abstract, uh, video abstract of a movie that we just uh, um, published, a paper that we just published. Uh, let me see. So I hope you can see this all. Over the past few years, ocean salt water has been reaching further into the river and freshwater regions of the Mekong Delta. I think there is a problem here with the streaming. Maybe I do it again. I refresh the page. One second. <clears throat> yeah. 
Yes, now it's good. Over the past few years, ocean saltwater has been reaching further into the riverine freshwater regions of the Mekong Delta. So what I choose on is one of the major issues of the Mekong Delta of Vietnam. Increase the freshwater supply to agricultural land and the whole Delta ecosystem. In the deltas, many processes influence saline water intrusion. Among them, most importantly, ocean tides and fluvial discharge. But also other natural forces such as winds, waves, ocean surge, precipitation and evaporation also influence saline water intrusion. On top of that, human significantly strains the natural resources of deltas by agricultural water demand, sediment starvation due to upstream dams and sand mining, groundwater extraction that leads to sudden subsidence, and climate change that could lead to sea level rise and upstream discharge anomalies. To implement measures against salinization and to predict the future, it is important to understand why we observe increased salinity intrusion. We did a field campaign to measure the salinity intrusion during the extreme event of 2016. We went out to measure the strongest salt intrusion in the Mekong ever recorded. The 2016 event damaged about 129 hectares and it costs about 215 million Vietnam dollars. During spring and heat tides, we traveled upstream at 30 km per hour at the speed of tidal propagation and measured vertical salinity profiles every 3 km using connectivity sensors. A strong stratification difference was observed between neat and spring tide. We discovered that increased stratification during neat tide results in upstream salt transport, while reduced stratification during spring tide stimulates salt flushing. In addition to the fieldwork, we developed the first delta-wide 3D model of the Mekong Delta and Delta 3D Flexible Mesh that integrates <coughs> riverine, estuarine and coastal dynamics within one numerical domain. One of the primary findings of the modeling work was that ocean surge can increase salt intrusion by as much as 10 km during the dry season and its effect can last twice as long as the surge duration itself. But perhaps the most consequential finding was that the delta is extremely vulnerable to drought because of erosion which is driven by sediment starvation. Erosion can be seen in the riverbanks or riverbeds. Incision of the riverbeds uh, has increased the stratification in some of the estuarine channels of the Mekong Delta. This activates 3D sub-processes that amplify inland salt intrusion. We have shown that if the riverbeds did not change over the past two to three decades, salt intrusion during the 2016 extreme drought event would be significantly lower in some places as much as 20 kilometers. <coughs> This is substantial evidence that suggests river bed levels are existential assets to the livelihood and the way of life within the world's largest and most vulnerable deltas. So I uh, stop uh, that one is finished and go back to the <coughs> slide. Um, Okay, um, so where do we go from here? So now that we have identified uh, uh, the drivers of change, we see, we've seen that salinity is increasing. Um, we more or less understand what is exactly happening in the system. Sea level rise of three millimeter per year, tides are rising 20 millimeter per year, river erosion of <clears throat> 10 to 15 centimeter per year. We know that fluvial discharge is changing, fluvial sediment supply is changing. We basically have an understanding of um, <clears throat> how um, uh, salinity is uh, driving inside. And, and uh, we know that uh, uh, subsidence, uh, how subsidence has uh, developed uh, spatially varying over the entire Mekong Delta. And we know that how it's going to de develop in the future. How can we integrate all of this to understand what is happening uh, what is going to happen in the next century. 
So we could, uh, using the existing numerical models, we could integrate coastal and inland processes. We can basically uh, integrate upstream and downstream processes. We have integrated climate change and anthropogenic drivers and climate change mainly in upstream discharge and downstream sea level rise and anthropogenic drivers mainly in subsidence and erosion. Uh, combining them all, <coughs> basically integrating surface water and groundwater dynamics uh, uh, which uh, we used uh, the, the 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 first 3d hydrogeological model of the delta that philip already explained uh, as well as the first uh, uh, 3d uh, numerical model of the entire mekong delta surface water of the entire mekong delta um, which uh, for instance in this figure you see a little bit of a simulation along the seven main estuarine channels for instance you see that how salinity is changing with the rising and falling tide. So every uh, lapse is uh, one hour. So these are one hour snapshots and how you see the salinity is an extremely dynamic process uh, in a Delta X system. Um, so with all this, we could actually integrate all of these processes uh, to see how salinity uh, would change, um, let's say in the next three decades on the year 2050. And we have disintegrated, for instance, what is the exact effect of climate change. So if it's only climate change, um, we can expect up to 67% increase in areas affected by salt intrusion. If we add land subsidence and different scenarios, we looked at two different scenarios, this, this percentage can increase up to 11%. And then we add river bed level changes then we see suddenly a, a much uh, more uh, grave uh, 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 image that can uh, lead to additional 36% increase in areas affected by salt intrusion in the, in the, in the scale of the Mekong Delta. Uh, to make it a little bit more visual, so if you just look at uh, climate change, we actually see that by the year 2050, most probably salt intrusion is going to be stable uh, in the Delta. There will be increase, but it will be stable. If we only look at climate change, uh, if we add subsidence, uh, two different scenarios of subsidence, subsidence can lift this uh, uh, further up, another five to six percent. Um, but uh, perhaps the biggest threat uh, to uh, to the delta in terms of salt intrusion is in the riverbed erosion in the, uh, uh, and riverbed level changes. And if we uh, add extreme sea level rise, so uh, we know that sea level rise uh, is accelerating faster than it was. Uh, previously estimated so if we also add extreme sea level rise like 60 centimeter by 2050 all these lines will be lifted much uh, further higher so it's a very complicated system and we had to do a lot of more sensitivity analysis to uh, to show how many of uh, these environmental pathways can be expected for the delta so this brings me to my uh, conclusions that uh, the basically in the short term within the uh, policy scope of two to three decades anthropogenic drivers um, uh, determine the fate of the delta beyond 2050 perhaps uh, climate change and uh, relative sea level rise depending on the policy development would perhaps take over the issue of salt intrusion in the, in the delta there are challenges and opportunities the challenge is that uh, many of these processes can be irreversible uh, and the opportunity is that a lot of them are man-made so we can by effective policy making we can influence some of these trends <coughs> before <coughs> there's no point of return um, uh, the the rise and fall project as a whole uh, had uh, 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 significant policy implications in uh, in Vietnam. It basically shifted the narrative on the Mekong Delta from the discussion on the climate change towards anthropogenic drivers. Um, we managed to show that anthropogenic drivers overtake uh, the existing um, unwanted trends in the Delta, and this has uh, shifted the narrative over the last uh, five years. Um, the, the mitigating uh, groundwater extraction and sand mining and reinstating flooding as a mean of sedimentation has been uh, taken up by the government uh, as, uh, as 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 a uh, as as a policy. Uh, there are uh, various initiatives uh, and. Uh, um, 
let's say, uh, spin-offs uh, from the project uh, to, for instance, uh, support transforming farming practices in Delta, like going towards mixed rice and agriculture. So it's more of a uh, uh, adaptation rather than medication. We have to adapt. There will be change. That's uh, that's. Uh, that's going to happen. So how can we adapt to the situation? We're discussing, for instance, mixed systems of rice and agriculture. Um, and perhaps the main implication, in my opinion, was that we have to look at integrated solutions uh, through a systems approach. Because if we look at incremental change, or if we look at individual problems, we have we probably cause another problem somewhere else. As an example, if we look at, we, we know that there is river bank erosion in the Delta. And if let's assume that we come up with that without understanding the entire system, we look at one single solution for stopping uh, river bank erosion at a certain area, like a local uh, in a local level, we perhaps not doing anything but spending money and 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 basically migrating the problem to another part of the delta. So understanding this um, integrated image is extremely crucial, and it's not only the delta, but it's the entire system, the the river basin. Um, uh, we have some lessons learned for ourselves. Uh, we, uh, uh, within the project, we know that technological advances, be it uh, numerical models, computation capacity, uh, instruments, and all that, they they can help significantly. And what we have uh, done, for instance, in the last five years, it would be impossible 20 years ago. Um, Data and local network are fundamental. Uh, without actual data, we, were, we would not be able to uh, carry out any useful scientific research, honestly. And the local network and the local support we had was extremely crucial in whatever we, uh, we did. Um, complexity of the deltaic system requires critical science. Uh, and that means that the system is so complex and it has so many drivers that simplification of the problems does not necessarily help solving the problems. And it needs a really critical look into all different aspects of the system because it's so much vulnerable to any change. And by overlooking this complexity, we might overlook, uh, um, uh, we, might, we might miss a lot of insights into that. Uh, and the last thing, um, uh, research update, uh, uptake uh, and uh, uh, of the Rise and Fall project required critical science and local presence and proactivity over the uh, the lifetime of the project and beyond because we are still both Philip and I are active in the in the in the policy implication policy development and Delta and that brings me to the last uh, lessons learned that. Uh, Looking at this picture from the first uh, urbanizing deltas of the world workshop in Ho Chi Minh City, that uh, we have to enjoy life as uh, much as possible before uh, there is a global pandemic. I'm hoping that we can all uh, meet again anytime soon. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, we can uh, move on to the. Questions. Thank you, Seper. I, uh, I really enjoyed uh, your presentation. Uh, very insightful, also in relation to uh, the, the presentation of Philip um, and how this relation is between soil subsidence uh, and soil intrusion, but also some of the other uh, aspects that have an influence on that. that um, um, have an inf uh, yeah, have an influence on soil intrusion and. Um, so the subsidence. I would like to thank all the participants as well for submitting your comments already in the chat box. And I saw with one of my eyes that there was already a lively discussion going on. Uh, so thank you, Philip, also for already answering some of these comments in the comment box. Um, but I would like to continue and we have only a few, not so many minutes left, but um, I think uh, the title of this master class is Getting Grip on sinking, shrinking, and saltier deltas. And then there have been several um, comments or uh, questions either on the Facebook uh, comment box or the YouTube comment box on um, on policies, on what can we do, adaptation versus mitigation measures. Um, and also, what can other deltas in the world maybe learn from the lessons that you have uh, seen here? And um, so maybe in relation to getting grip, 
can you maybe give some uh, insights already on what you already see now? Yeah, are there is there an urgency felt among local policymakers in the in the Mekong Delta? Um, so are they trying already to get grip? Are there maybe already some good examples? And also, uh, what do you uh, think for the future? Huh? There is, for example, the Mekong development, uh, the Mekong Delta plan that also proposes a certain kind of agro business development. There are, of course, other development plans also in the area. Um, so maybe first, um, Philip, maybe you could mm -hmm. yep. share some of your insights on this. So, so uh, I think the, um, uh, let's say, the, the end conclusions that uh, Saper presented for this, this masterclass, they, 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 they are echoing in this a lot. So um, uh, there's really this shift in the last couple of years with the, the let's say, prime focus on, on climate change and the problems induced from that. And now also seeing there's actually environmental change, which is partly driven by humans. Uh, and that should also be taken into account because it's actually creating more changes at present. Um, and this is uh, that there's really a rapid shift um, in, in terms of realization uh, happening in Vietnam. And there's now there's a number of there's there's national policies even uh, recognizing it. Uh, this, for example, there's now um, uh, all the provinces in the Delta are now working on a plans to um, to create groundwater protection zones with uh, actually the focus to limit land subsidence and salinization of the groundwater. Uh, and this is something that, that really was a couple of years ago was not, not happening because it was not simply not on the radar. Um, so there's, uh, I would say there's a lot of effort going on and the changes and realization are really going fast. So that gives, it gives myself at least a, a lot of hope. Um, and what, what we see, for example, this Mekong Delta plan, which the first version was from 2013, that uh, in that plan, you also see this, let's say, um, the issues of land subsidence, for example, was mentioned, but it was also mentioned we don't have uh, a lot of data on it, so we don't know what, what we should do about it. Um, but now, I mean, in the new plans, this is, uh, at least from the Vietnamese government, this is really uh, getting a more and more prominent position. But... Um... How we saw that certain agricultural developments have a stronger impact on soil <laughs> subsidence. And I think some of these um, proposed agro-business developments might actually induce more soil subsidence if, with my limited uh, look on it. So how would, how would that yeah, really? It's, it's basically a question, let's say, where is the water coming from? And uh, in the last decades, the, the, let's say the whole development of the Delta is in a way fueled by two basic things, which is one is, is fresh groundwater and the second is, uh, is sand from the river uh, channels, as Saper um, talked about. So these, these two basic, let's say, commodities, natural resources are being overexploited um, and that is causing a lot of the issues that we talked about. So basically you have to search uh, towards development of your agro business system or any other uh, system that is not causing over exploitation in either one of these two uh, resources. Um, and that may mean that you actually have to maybe downscale uh, your productivity or find technical solutions that are actually uh, allowing you to keep up, uh, let's say, high productions, but not uh, exhaust these resources. Yeah, and <clears throat> if I may add, um, <clears throat> um, on um, um the, the the so the agro models the agro the agricultural models that are being proposed um are now being informed by all these trends and especially understanding the spatial variability of the trends uh and that feeds to uh to to, to, to how you're going to develop your agriculture uh, model how do you develop your cycle how to uh, maximize, for instance, sediment intake, how to not use groundwater. Uh, basically, groundwater used for agriculture, even right now, is forbidden. It's mainly used for aquaculture uh, because the volumes of uh, uh, water for uh, agriculture is just uh, 40, 50 times larger than uh, what is being used in the groundwater system. But the groundwater has a, a significant sensitivity, uh, its extraction on, on land substance. So that's, um, <clears throat> that's, uh, th th that's one of the impacts um, and one of the important uh, conclusions that um, 
uh, it's not about that agriculture, you have to stop agriculture, but you should just do it smarter. Uh, perhaps use the technology that is available, but also understanding the system, develop your system in a way that is not uh, consuming your natural resources and even maybe recovering part of your trends. Um, on another point, you mentioned, uh, Yap, uh, and the implications for other deltas. These trends that we see in the Mekong Delta, it's not only in the Mekong Delta. At least Southeast Asia, uh, we see a lot of these trends. In Ganges Brahmaputra, in um, Airavadi, in uh, Chao Phraya, in uh, Pearl River, in Red River, similar trends have been seen. Uh, maybe in one of them, more subsidence, more less salt, salt intrusion or sand mining. But it's, it's like there is a proportion of the problem driven in all of these deltas, a large proportion of problems driven with all of these del de deltas with the same processes, dams, sand mining, and groundwater extraction. These three are driving the main changes in the macro in the deltas uh, in the region and around the world, which basically means you need similar in-depth studies for each of these deltas to be able to develop uh, effective policies. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, and I was indeed also very uh, surprised to see also indeed the differences that you found in your studies in comparison to uh, to earlier studies on the land elevation, but also on the river uh, bed uh, depth. So that uh, also is in, was very insightful, I think. Uh, what I think is also um, an interesting point you mentioned, and it relates, of course, to the uh, relates to the sediment trapping in dams, which is of course a very um, urgent issue uh, also in the Mekong with the, the, all the proposed dam developments. And I think that is also something that we see in other basins around the world, especially also with the revival of um, hydropower. Um, and how would you see the, the international cooperation um, here in the Mekong um, River Committee? You, is um, so there is uh, there is an ongoing uh, strong debate between the basin countries. Um, let's uh, so the Mekong River Commission is uh, let's say the coordinating body between the lower basin countries, uh, and China is not part of that. So China has its own policies, but all of these conversations are ongoing. For instance. Um, while there was a peak in increasing uh, dam develop hydropower development, especially along the mainstream, the impact of that is already seen in the in the hydrological cycle of the uh, river, and its impact has been actually part of what happened in salt with salt intrusion in the delta over the last couple of years. Uh, having seen these, for instance, Cambodia has stopped its um, uh, hydropower plants. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, 2019. And they also had their plans in uh, in, uh, in, in uh, how to power development. Laos is under a lot of pressure uh, by the lower basin countries to stop their hydropower plant development. Um, mm. But it's an ongoing debate uh, and it's... Uh, it's mm. Yeah, and, and to add to that, um, Sapel, the, the interesting thing that our research shows, right, because the, the discussion of upstream uh, riparian countries and cross, cross transboundary issues with these rivers is, is, um, is quite old. Uh, and, and in a way, it's, it's um, in the past, it's been either looking downstream, let's say, uh, sea level rise, climate change, or upstream uh, dams in the, in, the, in the basin, but not really looking into your own backyard. And I think what our research really showed is that a lot of the changes that are happening are actually caused by activities that are happening at the local scale. Um, not all of them, of course, there's, especially when we go to, to, uh, to salt water intrusion and sediment dynamics, there's, there's a big upstream component, but there's also a big component actually happening in, inside your own jurisdiction. So yes, it's important to talk as a basin, right? Uh, but it's also important to realize that you have actually some control and quite some control just by managing your own, um, what, what is inside your own jurisdiction. And yes. what is very important is this, this, uh, this, this integrated systems approach that Saper also mentioned. So not looking at the individual aspects as has been done, let's say classically, but really crossing borders of disciplines and not just, let's say, guys like us who study the physical system, talking to other guys who study the physical system, but actually creating this really integrated approach where we connect and combine also, uh, let's say, the, all, the, all, the, all the human aspects and dimensions into this 
uh, in, into, let's say, the, the road towards solutions, because this is yes. the only way that we can create, uh, let's say, uh, uh, we can sustain a livable uh, system in these deltas. Yes. Thank you, uh, Philip. And with that um, proper message uh, been shared with uh, all the audience, and that's, I think, also the general message in relation to um, climate change mitigation and adaptation, um, it's easy to look also at others, but also look at yourself uh, first. Um, we are at the end of this masterclass. I already hear the church bells uh, uh, ringing uh, in the back. So it means that it's 11 o'clock local times, uh, in which is time to end this session. So I would like to thank you, Seper and Philip, for your very interesting presentations. I really think also our audience have enjoyed it and appreciated it very much. And it shows that it, there is... Um, uh, also already a lively debate. I'm uh, inviting you to have another look at the comment box and uh, give individual uh, replies to these participants. I think that would be appreciated very much. So thank you. Then I would like to um, invite also, of course, all the participants to join us again next week, um, because next week we start at the same time. Um, so on Wednesday, 22 September, 21. Um, we start again at 7.30 GMT, that's 9.30 in the Netherlands, uh, with Dr. Sanchayan Nat and Badrul Hassan. And the topic of our uh, masterclass will then be thinking about complex urbanizing delta systems. So thank you, Philip. Thank you, Sepper. Thank you, all participants. Also, thank you, Leon, Shanur, and Laura, who supported us on in the on the back of this um this master class your help was much appreciated and i'm looking forward to every to see you online again next <coughs> week thank you very much thank you thank you bye